In the last lecture, we were talking about the culture of uh, the New Deal era and how in many ways that culture was very reflective of what was happening at the time, whether you're talking about sports or comic books, literature, music. There, there's a lot of different genres that really emphasize this culture of inclusion, culture of collectivism. Okay. Um, while the culture of the 1930s was really remarkable, beautiful in a lot of ways, the 1930s, the Great Depression era, also proved to be fertile ground for a, a very ugly kind of culture, okay? A very dark side of American populism. Um, before we go any further, I need to uh, talk about a term that's going to be very important for the next couple of um, uh, lectures, and probably really the semester, and that term would be fascism. Okay, Now, you hear the term fascism tossed around very loosely in our uh, society in this day and age, but fascism is, is, is a really complicated and, to, in this day and age, very misunderstood kind of concept. Okay, Fascism essentially traces its roots back to Benito Mussolini, who was an Italian dictator that had come to power in Italy in the 1930s that uh, called it fascismo, right? Now, if, if you translate that literally into English, what you're going to get is the bundling of power, right? That, that's what he meant. He meant that he wanted to bundle power and concentrate it into his own hands or into the hands of a very tiny select group of people, okay? So there's three pillars to the term fascism that I need you to be mindful of, and one of them is the word dictatorship. One of the things that defines fascism and fascists is that they tend to be dictators. They don't really tend to be all that big of fans of democracy, the democratic process, or giving the quote-unquote people uh, a say in uh, their their day-to-day their -day lives. So bundling of power and concentrating it to the hands of one dictator or a very small select group of people, usually the financial elite. Okay. The second thing that I want you to know about fascism is it generally tends to scapegoat, to blame uh, political, racial, ethnic, religious minorities for the problems of whatever society that you're talking about. So the classic example of fascism would be what was going on in 1930s Nazi Germany, um, and it's the Jews, and to a lesser extent the Slavs, that Adolf Hitler blames for the problems that is uh, post-World War I Germany. So in addition to dictatorships, fascists like to assign blame, or at the very least scapegoat, political, racial, ethnic minorities for various problems. Lastly, the last pillar of fascism that I need you to be mindful of would be the idea that fascists generally like to go on military conquests, right? If you think about the great fascist leaders of uh, world history, Hitler, Mussolini, Hirohito, Franco, all of them were mili uh, militants, okay? All of them, uh, to some extent, used the military for their own devices, whether that be conquering um, uh, various parts of Europe, like Adolf Hitler, or whether that be like Franco, who's using it to consolidate power in Spain. The one thing that I would like to add when it comes to fascism is that most Americans um, generally think of fascism as something that's over there. In other words, a lot like terrorism, uh, that, that's not something that's inherently American. Nothing could be further from the truth. Um, in, in a lot of ways, America really wrote the book on fascism even as late as the 1930s. Let me give you an example. One group that's unmistakably fascist that's operating in the United States is a group called the Black Legion. And for your notes, the Black Legion was an offshoot of the KKK. Okay, If you're following along with me in this uh, slide entitled And Then the War Came, uh, that first slide, The Rise of Fascism, if you look at that slide, right next to the Klansman, the guy in the white hood, uh, is a guy in a black robe and hood, and that would be the Black Legion with the skull and crossbones on his um, hat and hood. Um, the Black Legion was a group of Klansmen that felt that the Klan had lost its crazy edge. It wasn't quite crazy enough. It needed to really revitalize itself, so it was an offshoot of the KKK. 
okay? Now, don't get me wrong, the Legion hated basically everybody that the clan had hated, but it really broadened its scope of its hate. And as I'd mentioned before, one of the things that fascists really love to do is blame other people for their problems. And in the case of the Black Legion, one of the groups that they blamed were immigrants. All immigrants, and the descendants of immigrants too, I might add, but in particular, um, um, first-generation immigrants. And so what they would do is in the middle of the night they would go on these things called night rides and they would arrive at the uh, the homestead of a known immigrant in some town or some city and they would beat them up or they would put them on a train and ship them out of town, burn their house and their belongings to the ground. So for your notes, the Black Legion is a clear example of fascism in the sense that it's it's really operating and recruiting on the idea that if we didn't have all these immigrants, if we could just do something about these immigrant problem, um, life in the United States would be infinitely better. So the Black Legion is a good example of American-born fascism. As is Huey Kingfish Long, okay? Now, Huey Long was a Democratic politician from the state of Louisiana, and he was a very popular politician, okay, at least at first. Kingfish, as he liked to be called, had a program that he called Share Our Wealth uh, that really, really took off in, the, in Louisiana in the 1930s. What Share Our Wealth involved was um, taxing the incomes of very wealthy Louisiana residents and corporations that were operating in the state of Louisiana. Exorbitantly high, very, very high taxes. And the thought was, it was these people that had really been instrumental in bringing about the Great Depression, and therefore they should have something to show for it. Okay. Now, this might make for good politics, but it's very difficult to implement things of that sort. Um, Franklin Roosevelt found this out in the first hundred days, that it's one thing to talk on the campaign trail about what you're going to do to corporate America when you get to the White House. It's another thing to actually deliver on that promise. Kingfish really did his best to deliver on that promise. In that respect, what I need you to know about Kingfish is he was a dictator. For all intents and purposes, he, he, he suspended the small d democratic process in Louisiana. He shut down local governments in places like New Orleans, Alexandria, Baton Rouge. He had a uh, secret police force that was uh, not only undercover, plain clothed, but answerable to him and him alone. Um, it doesn't get much more textbook than uh, Huey Kingfish Long when it comes to American-born fascism, especially in the 1930s. Okay? The last individual that I'd like you to be mindful of when it comes to American fascism would be uh, Father Charles Coughlin. Okay? Now, like Huey Long, Coughlin, at least initially, was a big proponent of the Democratic Party. As you might imagine, he was a, uh, a Catholic priest, and his parish was in the metro Detroit area. He would later go on to become sort of the Rush Limbaugh of his day. He was a radio superstar, and he had a syndicated program where, in some cases, millions of Americans tuned in every day to hear him talk. Now, what Father Coughlin talked about on his radio show really ran the gamut in terms of socio-economic political issues in American life, but one of his favorite political whipping boys was gang, or excuse me, banksters. And he, what, what, what he said was it was essentially bankers that had caused the Great Depression, and one of the things that he really wanted the Roosevelt administration to do was more or less take over the banks, to take over the big banks that he felt were instrumental in the causation of the Great Depression, and basically have a government-ran banking system. Now, keep in mind, one of the things that fascism likes to do is concentrate power, be it economic or political, into the hands of very few people. So Father Coughlin is essentially calling for this when he's calling for a government takeover of America's banking system. Now, as we know, Franklin Roosevelt never really does that. About the closest thing that he does do is kind of use the federal government to buttress the banks, but nothing more than that, okay? And that really got under the skin of Father Coughlin, who became one of the biggest critics of Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal toward uh, the end of the 1930s. But what I need you to understand, in addition to all of that about Father Coughlin, was he was a devout anti-Semite, a Jew-hater. 
right? Now we know that in the 1930s um, we're beginning to see the, uh, the, the initial stages, what Hitler would later call the final solution to the Jewish problem. And so Father Coughlin, around about this same time, has begun to describe the Great Depression as an international Jewish banking conspiracy. That Jewish bankers, not just in the United States, but throughout the world, had knowingly and consciously restricted the amount of capital in the banking system because they wanted the world economy to crash, to implement whatever kind of government that they were trying to implement. But nonetheless, Coughlin is a fascist in the sense that he does want to concentrate power into the hands of very few people, and he also is not above blaming ethnic racial minorities for the problems of um, the United States. Now, with all of this said, fascism really isn't a major threat in the United States, at least not the same way that it is in parts of Europe. Um, in Asia too, I might add. In Japan, for example, you see the rise of militarism and fascism through Emperor Hirohito. Now, in the Japanese faith, at least at that time, it was considered, the emperor was considered to be divine. He was a god. And so you can see how and why power was kind of almost naturally concentrated in the hands of a very select group of people in Japan. But one of the things that Japan begins doing in the 1930s is invading northern China, Manchuria. And there's unspeakable war crimes that are being committed by the Japanese uh, on the Chinese during this time. And um, the United States is very aware of this. We're not doing very much about it, at least in the initial stages, but we're very aware of what's happening in, um, in, in, in Japan. But we're, we're, we're doing our best to stay out of other people's business. Okay? In Italy, as I mentioned before, you see the rise of um, uh, Benito Mussolini. Uh, fascism comes to Italy in the early 1930s, and in addition to suspending the democratic process, keep in mind, Italy was once upon a time a democracy, and he pretty much got rid of all of that. He, won a mil he went on another military conquest, this time in Ethiopia. Now, you are talking about a predominantly agrarian society that Mussolini was trying to bomb back to the Stone Age uh, in the 1930s. In Spain, you see the rise of General Francisco Franco, who used not only the Spanish military, but German intelligence and German financial assistance, including that of Adolf Hitler, to really suspend the democratic process, implement a fascist regime, and pretty much install a dictatorship. Okay? But the scariest part of European fascism, the rise of fascism abroad, would not be Japan, it would not be Italy, it would not be Spain, it would be that in Germany. Okay? Now you begin to see the rise of Adolf Hitler in the early 1930s. And one of the things that um, Hitler is doing when he becomes um, um, more or less dictator, the leader of uh, Nazi Germany, um, one of the things that he begins to do is he begins to remilitarize Germany. Now, why is that an issue? Think back to World War I or the end of World War I. If you recall, I had said at the time, one of the provisions of the Treaty of Versailles that ended the war was that Germany was no longer really allowed to have a military. And so this catches the attention of both Britain and France that are asking Hitler, what are you doing? You're going to get yourself in trouble here. You've got to stop doing this. And Hitler basically explains, look, I'm not doing it for any particular reason. The German economy is on its face. I'm simply trying to get it going again. And more or less, Britain and France give him a pass on this. Um, several years later, Hitler begins to uh, initiate a campaign that he says is simply trying to reunite all German-speaking people of Central Europe. Uh, but more or less, what this is, is a military conquest. And so you see a formal alliance between Nazi Germany and Austria. Um, in 1938, you see the annexation of Czechoslovakia. Um, Adolf Hitler basically conquering it, not necessarily in a military fashion, but um, still annexing a sovereign nation. And at this point, by 1939, um, both Britain and France had warned Hitler we know what you're doing. We see what you're doing. It's just not about getting the German economy going again. And if we see you invade Poland, that was the final straw. If you invade Poland to your east, we will declare war on you. 
Well, by 1939, Germany had a well-oiled war machine, arguably the, 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 the greatest war machine in the world, and it was almost a foregone conclusion that he was going to invade Poland. Now, September 1939, he invades Poland, and that's when most historians will, will say World War II has begun. Now, before I go any further, uh, I want to go back to World War I for just a moment. Um, we know that the German suffering had, uh, had, had, had really been great under the Treaty of Versailles. Blame Germany for starting the war, which it really didn't, at least not so more so than any other country involved. And it forced it to pay back all the war damages. And so I think it's only a matter of time before you see some... Uh, populist uh, politician like an Adolf Hitler, who was very popular, at least initially, um, come along and kind of exploit all of this resentment of the German people. And that's exactly what happened. So what I need you to understand is that World War I essentially gave rise to World War II. Now, in what, what, what I need you to understand that the United States is trying to do when World War II breaks out, when Britain and France declare war on Germany after the German invasion of Poland, we're trying desperately to stay neutral. And I, and I want you to write that down. The United States is desperately trying to stay out of the war. The reason why is we had such a bad, such a terrible experience in World War I. And so we're pursuing a policy that we call isolationism. For instance, in 1935, Franklin Roosevelt signed something called the Neutrality Act. It emphasized that if you were a nation at war, if you were Britain or France, we're not going to sell you any kind of military um, um, products, right? I mean, even in the midst of the Great Depression, we would not sell warring countries American-made military products. 1937, we kind of added a little bit to that with a policy known as cash and carry, okay? Um, it said even if you're not at war, but you want to buy military products, from the U.S. First of all, you have to come get it yourself and take it away with you. And second of all, you have to pay us some cash. So it was almost discouraging foreign countries from buying American-made military products. Okay, All across the United States, you had pacifist groups, including the industrial workers of the world that were demonstrating in, 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 in city streets, demonstrating on college campuses to keep the United States out of what they felt was European affairs. You could see World War II coming, and, and people like the IWW wanted absolutely no part of it. Maybe an exception to this idea of isolationism would be something called the Popular Front. Okay, Now, think for a minute. Remember me talking about communism and the rise of the Communist Party and the goal of the Communist Party? The goal of the Communist Party was worldwide revolution. So communism is going to spread over every corner of the globe. In 1935, the International, the common turn in Moscow, really puts a stop to that. It, it suspends it, at least for the moment. And it says the main goal of the Communist Party anywhere in the world is to fight fascism. And so what I want you to write down next to the term popular front, popular front, I just want you to write down the Communist Party's policy of fighting fascism, okay? And this was very important to the American Communist Party to fight fascism, not only over in Europe, but also right here in the United States. Stand up to people like Charles Coughlin, who was a card-carrying, you know, textbook example of fascism. Stand up to people like Huey Kingfish Law, who was also a very vivid example of American fascism. Now, a really good example of the Popular Front mentality would be the Abraham Lincoln Brigade. Okay, Now, when war broke out in France, civil war I might add, um, the United States doesn't really do much to intervene. The, the, the lone exception would be the, American, the uh, Abraham Lincoln Brigade that sent uh, fighters, um, uh, soldiers, over, recruited and sent them over to Spain to fight Franco's forces. Now, this is more or less a communist initiative, and some of the people that were involved in the Abraham Lincoln Brigade were card-carrying members of the Communist Party, but many of them were just individuals that believed deeply in this communist commitment to fight fascism, that what was really, really important was standing up for democratic institutions. And so the last thing that I want you to write down next to the Popular Front is, in addition to giving up, at least for the moment, giving up on the idea of communist revolution, 
The popular front mentality is about teaming up with other individuals, be they members of the Democratic Party, progressive-minded Republicans, independents, socialists, anybody, um, that, that, that deeply believed in a commitment to democracy and wanted to fight fascism. So it's about the Communist Party's um, teaming up with other groups, you know, a lot, insert group here kind of mentality, to fight fascism. Okay, more of that in a few minutes. Now, as I mentioned before, Hitler's invasion of Poland officially starts the war, and even though we're staying neutral for the moment, Franklin Roosevelt is beginning to move us in the direction of war. Okay, um, he begins to increase America's uh, military production, and more importantly, in 1940, he issues something called his Four Freedoms or Atlantic Charter speech. Okay, now in 1940, France had been invaded by Germany and fell very, very quickly, and so if you're keeping score here, Germany, either through an alliance or through an actual conquest, is you know the master of Europe. Um, they had an alliance with Italy, an alliance with Austria, they had invaded Poland, uh, they had invaded France, had an alliance with um, Franco and Spain. Um, so at any rate, uh, Franklin Roosevelt can see the writing on the wall that there's only two um, nations, significant nations anyway, uh, of Europe that are still holding out. One would be Great Britain, the other would be the um, Soviet Union. And so therefore, um, Franklin Roosevelt basically tells the American people, we can't go on and remain the lone democracy anywhere in the world. Hitler's not going to stop uh, once he gets a hold of uh, Britain and the Soviet Union. Eventually he's going to come for, uh, for the United States as well. So these four freedoms that I need you to be mindful of here in his four freedom of speech, freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom of want, and freedom of fear. All of these things Roosevelt felt were instrumental in the causation of World War II and needed to be gotten rid of if we were going to have peace, lasting peace in the world. Okay. Now, um, one of the things that I also need you to be mindful of when it comes to moving America closer to war uh, would be the United States' you know, de facto relationship with uh, Great Britain. And so in 1940, even though he knows he can't sell Great Britain the military products to fight the Germans, he issues something called the Lend-Lease Act. And so we lent them the necessary material to fight the Germans. We leased it to them, but he was able to get around the Neutrality Act. And the reason for this is Roosevelt understands that America cannot survive as the lone democracy in the world. But when it comes to when it comes to America's entrance in World War II, it's going to take a lot more than the Battle of Britain or the desperation of France or anything like that. It's actually going to take a, a, a an act of war. And ironically enough, it's not going to be from the Germans. It's actually going to be from the Japanese, who also had an alliance with the Germans uh, by 1941. In December... 7th, 1941, uh, the Japanese bombed the United States Pacific Fleet at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Now the reasons that they bombed um, 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 our, our naval fleet in the Pacific uh, were many and varied, but more or less the Japanese understood the inevitability of war with the United States. Those two great empires in the Pacific, Japan and the United States, were bound to clash sooner or later. So we see some of those problems that we saw earlier in the, night, or the late 19th, early 20th century that was emerging between the United States and Japan are coming home to roost by 1941. So Franklin Roosevelt goes to Congress, gets a declaration of war, declares war on the Japanese. Germany, Japan's ally, declared war on the United States. And we have not only entered World War II, we've entered World War II on a two-front, two-war front basis, okay? Now, the last thing that I want you to be mindful of before we break for today would be something called the War Powers Act of 1941. What I want you to understand is the War Powers Act basically gave the president, in this case Franklin Roosevelt, unlimited amounts of power to wage the war any way he saw fit. 
Um, he could expand it into any part of the globe that he wanted to expand it. He could do anything at home that he felt was necessary to win this war. It's, for the moment anyway, pretty much unlimited executive presidential power. Now, this is going to be important for the theme of our class. How free are we if the president can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants? What I'd like you to understand about the War Powers Act is it can be great danger. It can do great, great harm, as you'll see in a moment. But it can also do great good, okay? Franklin Roosevelt is going to use the War Powers Act from time to time to expand the ideals of New Deal security. And you'll see what I mean in the upcoming lecture. But for the time being, I want to give you an example of the great harm that it could do to American democracy. Executive Order 9066, essentially translated into Japanese internment. Many of you may be aware that in the war years, Japanese Americans, especially on the West Coast, were sent to internment, basically prison camps, um, because the thought at the time was we got so blindsided by the bombing at Pearl Harbor that it had to be an inside job. In other words, there had to be Japanese, excuse me, uh, American-born Japanese spies operating in the United States that were giving away our secrets, and Franklin Roosevelt needed to secure the nation in that respect. Now, obviously, this is a very dirty stain on American democracy and American history, really, but it is also a product of the War Powers Act. It's a product of unlimited executive power, at least unlimited power for the time being. Now, when we come back, we're going to talk about what World War II did to American society here at home, okay? And so that's where we're going to stop it for today.